welcome to Atari Bytes, the show where we take a bite out of the story within a classic Atari 2600 game and see if that story bites us back. This is episode 313. My name is Bill. Thanks for listening. That's right, everybody. Welcome to Atari Bytes, the post-COVID edition. I'm alive. I have joined the COVID club and survived. That's right. Since I recorded last, I have surprised myself by getting COVID. I got it. My wife got it. My kid got it. We're all pretty certain how we got it, but that's all we'll say about that. You know, two years of vaccinations and reasonable precautions and everything, kind of out the window uh, because we done all got the COVID. Sophie, my daughter, got it uh, last month from uh, elsewhere and uh, had a couple of rough days and then she got past it. Henry tested positive, but had virtually no symptoms at all. Uh, except maybe for like today, a kind of sort of runny nose, but that was about it. Jill felt pretty bad for a couple days, and then she bounced bad, pretty much. Although she's still having taste problems. I did not get the, you know, classic uh, messes with your taste and smell. I might still stink, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, not that it's bothering me. I had, oh, I guess a low-grade fever, like 100.3 or something for a day or two. Real runny nose, which I'm still kind of getting over cough that was the worst part like a day or two i had one of those coughs that makes your ribs hurt that kind of deal that's pretty much gone at this point so yeah I mean, it could have been worse but uh but it wasn't fun that's for sure if there's any of you who by now aren't vaccinated just go do it i can't imagine what this would have been like if i hadn't been vaccinated actually i can't imagine it because there's been all sorts of reports about how bad it is if you get covid without being vaccinated so if by chance you're not just go do it. Quit whining about it. Go get the vaccination. Wear your mask. Uh, if you get it, quarantine for the appropriate amount of time. And uh, and then wear your mask after that for a while because you're still walking around with COVID germs. And you want to respect those of, uh, around you, uh, particularly those who may have uh, weakened immune systems, maybe can't get vaccinated for medical reasons. You know, you just want to be aware of other people, which is always a good rule anyway. So, yeah. But I am back, I am playing Atari games, I am uh, ready to talk about Atari games, which is good, because I'm doing an Atari podcast. We're kicking off the show this time with one of my favorite things to kick off a show this time. Um, We got some feedback. Uh, Our friend and Patreon supporter, Jose, uh, had a response to Tunnel Runner, the the game that we played last time on the podcast. Uh, Here's what he said. You will not believe the coincidence I just experienced. I'm watching a series on Amazon Video, and as soon as the the notification came in and I read it, they said the word tunnels on TV. How's that for timing? Whoa. I asked him whether he was also running on a treadmill at the same time. Tunnel runner. Um, He didn't respond to that. But I I dig, you know, I I dig the uh, synergy. Is that the right word? That's not the right word. The coincidence, I guess. That's good enough. Tunnel runner. Tunnels on TV. The short story from that episode tunnel vision featured a tunnel all very cool and i think really what we're learning here is that atari bytes is the center of all reality and everything comes back to atari bytes um which is why every man woman and child should be listening to this podcast thank you jose for pointing that out you may have saved the universe good for you sir seriously though uh thanks for the feedback If any of you would like to offer feedback to the podcast, you can certainly do that like Jose did by being a Patreon supporter and notifying me there of your thoughts and feelings. Or you can always send me an email. You can hit me up on social media. If you want to know how to do any of those things, hang around to the end of the show and I'll tell you. Bermuda, Bermuda shorts, Bermuda, Bermuda, Bermuda shorts, Bermuda, Bermuda, Bermuda Bermuda shorts, Bermuda, Bermuda, Bermuda shorts, Bermuda, Bermuda, Bermuda shorts. I don't usually do news on the podcast, but of course, the news that everybody's talking about this week is the potential new Pac-Man live-action movie. Possibly the worst idea for a movie since the last time they tried to do a Pac-Man live-action movie. Okay, I don't actually know if they've tried to do it before, but I'm guessing they have. Oh, okay, here, here you go. Uh, The worst idea for a live-action movie since the Mario Brothers live-action movie, which, uh, not surprisingly, they're trying to do again for some reason. This has been reported many places, of course, but at the moment I'm looking looking at an article on JoeBlow.com. Word of a live-action Pac-Man movie hit the internet earlier this week based on the 
a Japanese uh, Bandai Namco game from 1980. They give a little summary of how Pac-Man works, but I think we all know how Pac-Man works. This article mentions the Pac-Man cartoon uh, from Hanna-Barbera called Pac-Man, which aired on ABC from 82 to 83, and the CGI animated series Pac-Man and the Ghostly Adventures, which aired on Disney XD in 2013. I wonder if Disney Plus has that. For a while, I was doing uh, bonus episodes uh, where I and usually one or both of my kids would watch the Pac-Man cartoon and talk about it. I kind of, that kind of fell by the wayside. Life and everything sort of uh, got in the way. Maybe I'll go back to that eventually. Maybe I'll look for that Pac-Man that goes the adventures thing too. Um, the Pac-Man movie apparently is based on a concept by Chuck Williams, who d- also did Sonic the Hedgehog. And since that movie did so well, of course, that's why they're thinking about doing Pac-Man now. To be fair, uh, my kid and I watched the Sonic get the Hedgehog movie, actually not that long ago, and it was fine, actually. I didn't actively hate it. Sonic the Hedgehog 2, huge stinker, in my view. I don't know what my kid thought of it, but I was not impressed. So, this apparently is a thing that's happening. Hollywood Reporter says that the film would be produced on behalf of Wayfarer Studios, which is also doing a football drama called The Senior and a coming-of-age dramedy called Empire Waste, if any of that informs your opinion about the Pac-Man movie. I gotta tell you, Pac-Man is a beloved game. Love Pac-Man. I will happily sit and play Pac-Man anytime, anywhere. That said, I have zero interest in watching a live-action Pac-Man movie. Perhaps even less interest than I have in watching a Pac-Man cartoon, which also, honestly, may be part of the reason the bonus episodes fell by the wayside, because it was really kind of a chore to uh, to go watch that cartoon. All of that said, I will probably watch the Pac-Man live-action movie if it ever actually happens, but it's because, of course, accepting a concept as an idea for a movie doesn't mean the movie's going to get made. But if it does, I... Uh, in all honesty, I will probably watch it because I do an Atari podcast. Maybe I'll, you know, make it a bonus episode or something. Because I do an Atari podcast and I do an Atari podcast with stories in them. So it seems like an Atari-based movie, I should probably talk about that. So we'll see what happens. This has been Atari Bytes, the news desk. I do news so infrequently, I should have some sort of a sting that goes uh, with these low news reports. If any of you creative types want to come up with something for me, please do. All right. Let's move on to this week's game. This week's game is Stronghold for the 2600 from Kamavid, 1983. The manual is a a very stark blue and white and black manual. Um, We see a a flying saucer on the cover, firing a laser at a wall, basically. Doesn't make any sense until you actually play the game and understand what's going on. Pardon me as I belch through this podcast. Uh, The cola is fighting back. Destroy the galactic trap. Space security approaches the abandoned asteroid Stronghold, trademark, activating a volley of defense drones. Skillfully, you must pilot your attack ship through the explosive space waste. A single scrape will pierce the skin of your fragile ship. Well, that seems like poor design to me. Without warning, the bleak surface of the heavily fortified Stronghold is energized by three moving force shields that protect a lethal asteroid crawler. The automatic systems of the seemingly derelict Stronghold are functioning perfectly, Heat sensor interceptors launched to track and destroy your spacecraft. Survival depends on blasting through the whirling force shields and devastating the crawling command center as it fires repeatedly, trying to eliminate your frail ship. The diabolical stronghold has one last defense mechanism, a magnetic mega field that forms at the outer limits of the asteroid's atmosphere. Slowly, it expands towards the surface, trapping you within a diminishing combat zone. Can you fight off the interceptors, blast through the force shields, and exterminate the armored command crawler before your time expires? Tension mounts as, the, as hair trigger reflexes and unerring accuracy are mandatory for survival. Only you can annihilate the stronghold and move on through the galaxy to neutralize another more deadly space menace. Donald Trump, perhaps? Sorry, that was me, not the manual. Back in 1983, Donald Trump was just uh, a weird pop culture curiosity. Stronghold, trademark is the latest in a series of video challenges brought to you by Comavid. How do you play the game? Well, first you turn off your game console, you shove that cartridge in there, and then you turn on your game console. They recommend setting both difficulty switches to B. Uh, there are 16 possible game variations, number one being the basic game, and then it goes from there. You must pilot your attack ship through the defense drones, destroying or dodging them. When the shields close, Blast through them and destroy the command crawler to neutralize the stronghold. Hold the base of the joystick in your hand with the fire button in the left corner 
in the left corner nearest the TV. So your ship just kind of looks like a flying saucer thing. And then there are patrollers, there's the command crawler at the bottom of the screen that shows up after a few waves. Um, there's the asteroid surface at the bottom of the screen. There's the force shield, which kind of looks like the multicolored wall layers in like uh, the breakout game. There are interceptors, which look like owl eyes, basically. Uh, the mega field at the top, which as the game goes on, pushes down on you. Uh, the reserve ships are shown at the top. Your score is shown at the top. Here's where I start to get annoyed with the game. Push the fire button on the joystick to fire your attack ship's gun. The gun always points in the direction your attack ship last moved. Fine, that's all good. However, the gun can never aim or fire directly to either side of your attack ship. In games with rapid fire, quote unquote, your attack ship will keep firing as long as the fire button is pressed. In other games, you must press and release the fire button for each shot. You can refire at any time by pressing the fire button. Any blast already in flight will be instantly recalled and a new one fired. That, to me, is super stupid. Because waves of ships are coming at you. You can hold still long enough to fire your blast, but then you have to move or you're going to be destroyed. But as soon as you move, the shot you just fired disappears. It makes no difference if it's single shot or rapid fire, quote unquote. When I was playing around the game today, I did worse with rapid fire, which should make it easier. Um, so I, I do not, uh, I, spoiler here, I do not like this game because of this. Maybe I'm just being whiny. Maybe some of you can convince me that this whole your blast disappears as soon as you move thing is just a nice little challenge. I think it's unfair. Moving on, when the game begins, you have five attack ships, one in play and four in reserve. A new reserve ship is earned each time you destroy a command crawler and neutralize an asteroid. Up to six attack ships can be held in reserve. For each section of shield you knock out, 10 points are scored. Destroying a drone, patroller, or interceptor scores 20 points. Destroying a command crawler scores 90 points. Collisions with the drones, uh, patrollers, or interceptors will destroy your attack ship. In addition, when you have broken a hole through the shields, the command crawler will be able to fire deadly bolts through the opening. In game versions with the mega field, it will begin to appear at the top of the screen shortly after the shields close and the command crawler emerges. The mega field is a dull red region into which your attack ship cannot move. As it moves down toward the asteroid surface, your maneuvering room has diminished until you are forced into the patroller zone where it can be very, diff very difficult to survive. Tips. You can't shoot directly to either side. Don't get outflanked by an attacker coming from the side. Watch out for rapidly Entering attackers, stay away from the top and bottom of the screen where new attackers are likely to come in. To keep track of the position of the command crawler without looking down at it, listen to the sound as it moves on the asteroid surface. The louder the sound, the nearer it, it is. When it is directly beneath and locked onto fire, a shrill warning alarm is given. Opportunities may arise to dive under the patrollers and blast the shields, but a poorly timed attempt is likely to be fatal. To survive the faster drone assaults, shoot a few to break up their pattern and then concentrate on dodging them. Which is really what it comes down to in the game. You have to worry more about dodging the waves coming at you than actually shooting them if you want to progress through the waves of the game. Because you cannot, at least in my experience, you cannot just destroy a bunch of ships in the early waves and rack up a bunch of points. You just need to avoid them as much as you can to get on to the good stuff. The mega field thing and the controller thing, whatever it is at the bottom of the screen. Because that's when things get interesting. That thing where it's basically squishing your playing field and all that. That's the cool part, but you got to get there. There are 16 different games with different combinations of rapid fire and armored drones and mega fields and etc. etc. Uh, there's one of those little grid things for that. And of course, remember, the next time you are shopping for fun in games, remember to look it for Comavid. And that is how you play Stronghold. For the 2600 from Comavid, 1983. I'm not rich or famous. I'm not a movie star, rock icon, first responder, nurse, doctor, or anybody else whom we all look up to. I'm just a schnook. Just like Bill, I love to tell stories. Unlike Bill, though, I'm not creative enough to write my own, so I just tell my own real-life stories in this book-read-by-the-author-style podcast, all about life lessons growing up, and every episode, a segment about music. Music that I love, artists that I admire, and sometimes even my own music. 
You can find Autobiography of a Schnook on all your favorite podcast suppliers, or you can go to schnookpodcast.com. That's S-C-H-N-O-O-K podcast.com. And I firmly believe the good goes around, and I sincerely hope that Autobiography of a Schnook proves to be some good that goes around your way. The video game critic gave Stronghold a grade of C, calling the game an ultra-rare space shooter that is repetitive but challenging. They say that you're controlling a hot air balloon with an appendage that can fire missiles up, down, and diagonally, but not sideways. Jellyfish ascend from below, and you'll need to shoot fast and perform evasive maneuvers. Did they play the same game I played? I don't get hot air balloon and jellyfish, but all right. A three-layered rotating shield eventually appears in the bottom of the screen protecting a small Mexican woman. Okay, that object is supposed to be the stronghold, but it's not very imposing. You can poke holes in the shield, but keep in mind that if you eliminate an entire layer, it will regenerate. When the woman lines up directly beneath you, she'll unleash a huge blast in your direction. Wow, this lady is pissed. Okay. There are 16 variations, but even the easiest will give you a run for the money. A variety would have been nice, but gamers looking for a challenge may find this appealing. Okay. In this week's episode of What This Game Is Not, we have this entry. This game is not... Stronghold, the historical real-time strategy video game developed by Firefly Studios, published in 2001 by gathering of developers for Microsoft Windows and uh, Mac OS X. That game focuses on uh, conquests through military pursuits uh, and also prominent economic and infrastructure development elements. There is both an economic and a military campaign to be played, and both are discussed in the game manual. In the English version, the game takes place in medieval Britain around the year 1066, but since there's not always a time limit, scenarios can continue hundreds of years beyond that date. If anyone has played Stronghold, the historical game, and want to tell me about it, uh, go ahead and contact me. Why not? This has been What This Game Is Not. All right, after the break, be strong and hold on for the rest of the show. All right, this episode, we have to get a strong hold on the field report. Ah. <laughs> See, that's funny, Henry, because the game we're playing is called Stronghold. You didn't. <laughs> wow. I expected a faker laugh it than that. It was really bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, I think. So, yeah, so we're playing Stronghold <laughs> for Atari 2600. And I will tell you right now, I already find this game very, very frustrating. So, uh, prepare to hear me swear. Alright, gratuitous headshot. Alright. This is one of those games where if you move, your bullet disappears. But if you don't move, you get blown up. So, I find it very frustrating. So really all I'm trying to do is live long enough for you to see some of the different ships. Uh, I'm the big pink and blue one, of course. There's all those little dragonflies flying around. I don't remember what the manual calls them. They'll call dragonflies to make them. I'm not going to make them show you any of this stuff. I'm going to have to start the game again. Ugh. I'm gonna dang it. Try this again. Because it does start to look kind of cool. It's no less frustrating after a few of these waves, but you gotta get there first. Thank <laughs> you. 
There we go. So we got now that we got this force field stuff going on at the bottom, and we got these guys. Where the hell those things are? And now I'm dead. But you got to see them. Those things are kind of cool. And you got this guy trying to shoot you if I had lived. And then you got this breakout style uh, wall thing that opens up every now and then, and you can shoot it and try and kill that guy before he kills you. But of course, I died before I got there. But trust me, it's kind of cool. Even if the game makes you want to break things. Uh, I'm sure I'll have more to say about that later. For now, back to you in the studio. Hey Atari fans, this is Michael, one of the hosts of the Atari XEGS Cart by Cart podcast. Join Bill, David, Kieran, and myself as we review cartridge-based games for the Atari's last answer, the 8-bit gaming system, as well as delve deep into their history. Kieran will also introduce everyone to the UK's budget games. You can listen to us on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music, Player FM, or from our website at xegs8bit.com. That's xegs, the number 8, bit.com. Second Duck on the Right and Other Very Short Stories is my new short story collection. Duck con artists, zombies... Things on fire, supervillain angst, and a future without poop are just a few of the topics in these stories. Also, the occasional really bad poem. Waddle on over to your favorite bookseller, or swim downstream to my website, carnivalofgleecreations.com, for more information. Insert quacking up joke here. Here's the thing about Stronghold. I kind of hate this game because of that rapid fire bullet disappearing thing. If it wasn't for that, it would be kind of a, an addictive, challenging game because it kind of looks like and feels like um, this isn't it, but maybe it's just the colors and the shapes of the ships. Turmoil. The, the layout is different, but otherwise, the, the sort of the frenetic pace, the colors, the, the look of the ships and everything, that's what I think of anyway. But yeah, that bullet disappearing thing is a huge letdown to me. Um, but again, if I'm wrong about this concept, because I don't like it in any game, feel free to try and convince me otherwise. Just remember, it's my show. <laughs> it's story time on Atari Bites. Yes, it's story, 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 story time. With Bill. This week's story is titled The Inevitability of History. The deck of the HMS Stronghold, an S class destroyer in the British Royal Navy, was silent as the ship approached its designated coordinates. We're here, Captain, the first officer reported, breaking the silence. Lieutenant Commander Tyler nodded. It was thrilling to be, in 1927, at the forefront of military technology with the new RAE Larynx project. Thanks to those who sacrificed in the Great War, the world might never again know conflict on such a horrific scale, but it was vital to be prepared, and the larynx could help secure a future of peace. Others, though, were less certain. Shall we prepare the mechanical soldier, Captain? The first officer said. Now you know that's not what it is. It may as well be, another lieutenant, Joffreys, pressed, a plane that flies without a pilot. It's ludicrous. That's enough, Joffreys, Commander Tyler said, rising to his full height, which, truth be told, was a couple inches shorter than Joffrey's, but he carried it well. We will carry out our mission, Tyler said. Understood? Aye, Captain, a chastened Joffrey said. Joffrey's went out on the deck of the stronghold to oversee final preparations for launch. The larynx sat, ready to usher in an escalation of the arms race. First, the British get an unmanned plane. Then the Germans. Then the Russians. What next? Bitter guns? Missiles that could wipe out whole cities? Destroying a man's reputation with distasteful but pithy... Messages in the daily newspaper? Never mind any of that. Joffrey's had a job to do, and he would do it. Final adjustments were made to the larynx's missile control panel. The weather was warm, the skies clear, wind in their favor. Perfect for a launch into both military history and military future. Joffrey's gave the final go-ahead to the autopilot controller. Mission leader Kyle put down his pipe and started the countdown. The countdown got to four when a voice startled the men on deck. Hey, chaps. The voice said, Gentlemen, I'm still in here, shouted Bluecoat Reginald Reggie Chesterfield, just before the cordite was ignited. 
an irritated exhaling of attention as the crew stood down while Chesterfield was ex extricated from the larynx. Sorry, fellows, Chesterfield said, last minute adjustments. The team resettled and refocused. Kyle restarted the countdown again. The cordite ignited and the larynx slingshot out over Bristol Channel. Wedged tight into the larynx housing, Lieutenant Joffreys had just enough arm space to rip apart the wiring that controlled the larynx's navigation. Joffreys grinned resolutely as the larynx drifted off its course. In the name of peace and sanity, he shouted as the larynx plummeted into the ocean. Ironically, falling at high speed into the Bristol Channel destroyed the larynx, but didn't kill Joffreys. Instead, an otherworldly serpent rose from the ocean floor, its tentacles securing a strong hold on the larynx housing, and devoured Joffreys like the dust in a pixie stick, then returned to the murky depths. No matter what we do, death comes in many forms and from many unexpected places. Hi, this is 8-Bit Rocket, Jeff Fulton, from the Into the Vertical Blank Generation Atari podcast. And you are listening to the incomparable William Pepper and his wonderful stories of the game within a game on the Atari Bytes podcast. When you are done here, come visit us in the Vertical Blank. Now, back to Bill. And that's our show. Thanks to Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com for Creative Commons' use of his songs, Reformat, Take a Chance, and Pinball Spring. Thanks to Sean Courtney for the story time theme. Did a hold on yourself I leave a strongly worded five-star review of this show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get a chance to do so. Email the show at ataribytes2016 at gmail.com. Like the show on our Facebook page. Follow the show on Twitter at Atari Bytes. Or follow me personally at Carnival of Glee. And also, do please check us out on Instagram. You can also call us, too. And I will never, ever answer the phone. But feel free to leave a message. 563-265-1978. I am waiting and eager to hear from you, but not talk to you. Check out the website, www.carnivalofgleecreations.com. You're going to find information and links and whatnot for this podcast, Atari Bytes, for my other show, It's a Podcast, Charlie Brown, and for books that I've written. That's right, my words on paper, so that you can absorb them without having to listen to my stupid voice. And there's all sorts of information about those books over there on the website, even some links to some, but not all, of the places that you can buy them. Consider supporting the show financially by becoming a member on patreon.com. And there's a link in the show notes where you can do that. Doing so helps keep the lights on here in the studio and also puts you into an exclusive club with these fine folks who have my eternal gratitude. Michael Tyler, Jose Cazeta, Sean Courtney, M. West, Jeremy L., Mark Super, Jim Goble, and Robert Ferguson. Thank you one and all. All right, all that's left is to tell you next time on Atari Bytes. So next time we're going to check out the Frog Demo. Some of you are probably familiar with this. It's a game, I guess, called Frog that never got finished, but the demo got out somehow at some point. No, there's not much to it. Not going to be a whole lot to say about the gameplay, but come on, it's frogs and frogs are cool. So I'm going to check it out for the next episode. Until next time, go play some old games. They've missed you.